Exodus chapter 20, Exodus chapter 20, you know that that chapter contains the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words. The Ten Commandments or the Ten Words, as the Hebrews would call them. We have looked at uh, the first commandment, we looked at that a couple of weeks ago, where God says, you shall have no other gods before me. Now, we're going to look at the second commandment. And I want to be honest with you today, we're going to cover this in two parts, because there's a lot that needs to be covered. You wouldn't think there was that much involved with you should have uh, no other gods before me, and then don't make any idols. And so this is going to be part one, in particular because as I was studying, there was a commentator that made some comments uh, about the attraction to idols, what that attraction is all about. And it was so impactful to me, I, think, I thought, I need to share that with the congregation. So next week, we'll take a look at why idols are so attractive, but today we want to look at the fact that what God says, you should not have <coughs> idols. So turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, and we, I'm going to start reading at verse 4. Exodus 20, verse 4. The Lord again is speaking to Israel while they're there at the base of Mount Sinai, and he is saying through the cloud, you shall not make for yourselves, or for yourself, a graven image. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, showing mercy, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. We just want to talk about, very simply today, no idols. No idols. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege to be with you, the privilege to be with your people, and Lord, for the awesome responsibility to open up your word. Speak to me and speak through me, Lord, that our hearts would be in tune with your will, with your desire. Lord, that we would always live, live to please you. We ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I want to read those verses again, and I'm going to define some words as I go along, as I am reading them. Uh, so bear with me. Start again at verse 4. You shall not make, and that word make there means to produce by labor. You should not manufacture for yourself. Though God is speaking to the entire nation at this time, at the base of Mount Sinai, this is a direct command to every individual. This is to a singular person. He is saying, William, Jack, uh, Aisha, don't make any idols. Now, he may be talking to the body of Christ as a whole, but he's speaking directly to every individual in there. Don't manufacture, don't produce any images, any idols, and that's what a uh, carved image is, uh, idol, something that's called of wood or stone, and then he qualifies that. Any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth, you shall not bow down, you shall not bow down to worship them, nor to serve them, which means to put in labor to work as in the service to a deity. We always talk about how people ought to serve the Lord, you ought to serve God, well, there are people who will serve a piece of wood, who will serve a rock. You shall not serve them. Now God qualifies why he's saying this. For I, the Lord, your God, again singular, your God, am a jealous God. And what the sense of that is, is the idea of being fiercely protective and unaccepting of disloyalty. When he says that he is jealous, it means that he is fiercely protective and he is unaccepting of disloyalty. And I think every person in this room that's ever been booed up with somebody, you got an idea how that goes. Well, let me, let me bring that to terminology for the older folks. You ever had a boyfriend or a girlfriend? <laughs> when you become exclusive, you've become jealous, you've become protective of that person, especially men. We have this idea that we want to protect the girl that we're with. 
but we also want her to be loyal to us. Though many times guys are not as loyal to the girl as the girl is to the guy. Yeah, somebody said that's true. You had one female say that's true. God says, I'm a jealous God, visiting the iniquity or punishing the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. He says, in contrast to that, but showing mercy, showing, that's the Hebrew word hased, which means uh, loyal love, enduring love to thousands. Third or fourth generation for those who hate me, but to uh, thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. What this commandment does, this commandment establishes for Israel and also for us today what is the correct, what is the lawful, what is the proper way in which God is to be worshipped. Remember how the choir was just singing? How you, how you were sensing the presence of God? We, we were caught up. Some standing with their hands up, others clapping their hands, some swearing from side to side. Some of you were like me, singing off key, loud as you could, because you, 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 you were feeling the presence of God. You were worshiping God. There's a proper way to do it. Paris has a law. You can't sing off key in his, in his praise team. It's not proper to do that. Therefore, he doesn't let me sing with them. <laughs> but I can stand in the back and I can sing unto the Lord out of the depths of my heart. Five keys off, modulating when I should not be modulating. Whether it's intentional or, or not. <sighs> All because God receives our worship. Now, this commandment is a prohibition not against just false worship, but creating something to worship falsely. The New American Commentary, the Exodus um, volume says this, the nature of idolatry is usually misunderstood by modern people. Idolatry was not merely the practice of worshiping by means of statues and or pictures as focal points for worship. It was rather an entire elaborate religious system and lifestyle, all of it running counter to what God desired and desires true worship to be. The attractions of idolatry were very powerful, intended to draw even the Israelites away from true worship and covenant obedience to Yahweh in most generations. It wasn't just the fact that someone had a statue, but the fact that the statue represented a deity. And in some cases, it would even, in Israel's case, it would represent God himself, Yahweh. And that's terrible. When he tells you, I am God alone first, you should have no other gods before me. And then he comes back and says, don't make any graven images. Later on in Israel's history, they violated both of those commandments over and over and over again. God is spirit. Y'all believe that? How do you know that? Well, that's what Jesus told a Samaritan woman at the well. You remember in John 4, 23 and 24, as he's talking with her, he says to her, but the hour is coming and now is. Not only is it coming, but it is now here in the present when the true worshipers will worship the Father in what? Spirit and truth. For the Father is doing what? He is seeking such to worship him. And then Jesus says in verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit, in truth. He didn't say you ought to. I suggest that you do. He says you must worship God in spirit and in truth. And because God is spirit, you cannot create uh, an image, cannot produce an image that's going to represent God. Because now what do you, in essence, do? You worship that image rather than worshiping the spirit of God. There is no image that can adequately represent God. Can I say that again? There is no image that can adequately represent God. When we pray, when we lift our hands, when we are singing and we hear the praise team or the choir singing, when you're in your car and you're driving along and, and then the presence of God invades your space and he takes over your heart, what do you visualize? 
You know what? Most of the time it's nothing. You want to know why? Because God is spirit. And you can't see spirit. God doesn't have a form that we can see that we can then manufacture or we can copy. Anything that's manufactured, anything that we would copy, anything that we would take a picture of, and we want that to represent God. You know what that actually does? It reduces God from who he is. It reduces God from being all powerful, from being all present, from being all knowing. And, and in essence, it elevates us, the created person, the created thing. It puts us in a place where we don't belong. A place of authority, a place of power. It's actually a place that is also unholy. We have to remember that we are the created thing and we are not the creator. Because the creator himself desires our worship. We need, to, we need to worship him. The problem is that man wants to give honor on his terms. On his terms. While God has already prescribed how he is to be worshiped and honored. Think for a moment. Those of us who have children, there are certain ways that we want our children to behave themselves in accordance to our rules. There are certain ways we want our children to address us. There's, there's a certain deportment our children ought to have when they are around us. We have prescribed to them, when I talk to you, you say yes or yes sir or no ma'am or whatever the case happens to be. You call me mommy, daddy, you call those other grown folks Mr. Mrs. We have that already prescribed and when they step outside of that, what do we do? We, we correct them. We want them to honor us that they, as they should. And so what God was telling the Israel, I'm God and God alone and you need to worship me in spirit and in truth. If we make anything that would visually represent God, we reduce and corrupt him for who he is. Notice again that I've mentioned that this word where he says, do not carve any image. It's, it means to produce, it means to manufacture, to make by the hand. But may I suggest to you this morning, not just with Israel, but where we are today as well. Sometimes we have idols, and the idols are not a statue. It's not a piece of wood, it's not a piece of stone, but it's an ideology. It's a philosophy. It's the way I see it. We worship that as opposed to worshiping God. Just this week, Jack and I were having a conversation and in the midst of the conversation I was thinking about this message and, and we are having issues in the city of Portsmouth when it comes to our politics. Those of you who live in Portsmouth, you understand that. And we've got people who are on the far left and those who are on the far right and some who are trying to be in the middle and what they're trying to do is, is to get us, the constituents, to buy into their philosophies. Either be on my far right, you be on my far left, or you be here somewhere in the middle. What they want us to do is, is to supplant God with their ideologies. And it happens in the church, it's perpetrated in the church. And can I say this, and I want to be totally honest about this, many times it is drawn along racial lines. It's drawn along color lines. There are some of us who are so in love with love. Check this out, man. We're so in love with love that we have forgotten who love really is. We are in love with the idea of what love ought to be as we see it. And that's what is preached in our churches. And that's what comes across as the true God. And that's an idol. On the other side, there are those who say, well, there are certain social standards that we should have. There are certain conservative uh, positions that we should stand on. And so when we stand on these positions that God loves this person but hates that sin, but God doesn't really hate that sin, they get all confused at what they're saying. Mm -hmm. There are those who hate more than they love. 
And they think that the hate, check this out now, that the hate is really what God perpetrates. But did you notice what he said here in verse 6? He's going to hold those who are guilty up to the third and fourth generation for those who hate him. But for those who love them. God has this balance. He knows that people are going to hate him. But he's going to love those who obey him. And what some people think is that you have to obey God because of what they say is right. And we're going to hate everybody else. Let me give you two cases in point, or two illustrations. Our ultra-conservative brothers and sisters, if someone has an abortion, that person needs to be killed. If someone is a homosexual, that person needs to be banished and done away with. They are so busy trying to hold to the law that they're forgetting about God's grace and his mercy and his love and his restoration. But then there are others on this side who say, well, it's okay to kill the babies because it's just a piece of tissue. Mm -hmm. A woman has a right to her own body, but what about the right of the life that she did not create and God created? Mm -hmm. And so we've divided ourselves in the church because we've got the idol of conservatism and we've got the idol of liberalism and we're forgetting about who the true God is. Our philosophies, our ideologies, they have become what we worship rather than God himself. Let's get back to the book, because is that not what Jesus said? Those who worship God, since God is spirit, they must worship him in spirit, nothing in front of you, nothing that represents him, and in truth. And where does truth come from? Truth comes from the word of God. And it can't be my own private interpretation of the word of God. It can't be my feelings about what this means. There's this, this, this thing called inductive Bible study. And in, with inductive Bible study, you sit, you read a passage of scripture, and then you say, well, this is what this means to me. You can read a passage of scripture and say, this is what it means to me. But if you don't take all of scripture together, and look at all the principles and how, and how God operated in certain ages, you'll get stuck with, this is what this means to me. That's why some folk don't eat right. That's why some folk can't work on Saturdays or Sundays. This is what it means. What does the whole Bible say? And, it's, and, and it takes a lifetime, y'all. It takes a lifetime of studying a lifetime of wrestling with, a lifetime of being taught what the Bible really is saying. It's amazing. I'm, I'm a little bit off track now. Good thing I didn't have this in my notes. It's amazing how when I'm studying for sermons and I, and, and, and I look at different commentaries, how often these guys disagree on stuff. Good solid guys. They still disagree. So my position then is, Lord, what are you saying? I've got to be careful when I am studying to, to talk to y'all not to find somebody who agrees with what Stephen feels. How I see it. How I want it to be. And give that to you because then my opinion becomes my idol. And I'm teaching you how to follow my idol. Don't make it. Don't produce it. You know, in our minds, we can come up with anything. One of the shows I like to watch on TV is Gotham. And another one is um, Agents, Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Because it's, it's, it's crazy. It's just, it's just stupid. And so, in, 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 in um, Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., this guy named Hive, he now revealed him true self. He could take on anybody's shape. And, it, and, and he revealed his true self, this ugly looking monster with tentacles and I don't know, it was a combination of four or five animals. And I'm thinking, um, that's imaginative. That's amazing how somebody's mind can think to come up with something that looks like that. It's also imaginative, imaginative for us to get in ourselves and our feelings, 
our opinions, the way I see it, the way I want it done, the way I want to please God, regardless of how God has already prescribed how he's going to be pleased. Did you notice how I said that? How he's going to be pleased. Because anything that you do that is not the way that he prescribes is not going to please him. You, we can't tell God, God, this is the way I see it and expect God to go along with us. It just doesn't happen like that. So any pictures, any images, any statues that depict things, remember how the Lord said to them, you should not make carved any images of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. He said, don't have anything that is going to depict those things as a representative of me. You can't copy anything. Because you know what, anything for the most part, anything that we come up with is something that we have seen elsewhere. It's already existing. So let me ask this question. Does it not then tend to, for those of you who know your Bible, don't you remember that in the tabernacle they had a table? They had the golden lampstand? They had the Ark of the Covenant? And they had the cherubim over the Ark of the Covenant? And it says it was on the Ark, on the mercy seat, that's where God dwelt. So when God told them to build those things, was God uh, violating his command not to have carved images. No, he was not. Again, the New American Commentary states, states this. The answer to that question is uh, decidedly no. These were objects associated with Yahweh, things that surrounded his self-manifestation and gave a sense of localization of his presence. But they were not in themselves, even remotely, objects that partook of the divine nature as idols were thought to do for the supposed gods they represented. And the Israelites certainly neither bowed down nor worshiped them. But some of you, again, Bible scholars might say, well, remember how they put Aaron's rod in the tabernacle and in the, uh, and didn't they not bow down to that? Yes, they started worshiping that rod and then what, God, what did God do? He got rid of that rod and he uh, punished them for that. So what is God's response to idolatry? Verse 5, the second portion of verse 5 says this. Here's God's response. First, as we said, for I, the Lord your God, I am a jealous God. I am fiercely protective, and I do not accept disloyalty. There are other passages in the Old Testament, several, that talk about God being a jealous God, and that he's jealous of um, his people's worship and their love. God is zealous. God is also exclusive in his relationship with those whom he loves. And he wants them to be exclusive in their devotion and their worship. God will not allow, nor will he accept, honor that's due him to be transferred to somebody else. The effects of worshiping or not worshiping idols. There are negative and positive consequences. Let's look at the negative consequences first. The first thing is, in, uh, in verse 5, the second part of verse 5, what does the Lord do? He visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate him. It goes without saying that there are consequences for sin. The soul that sins, it shall surely die. Notice what the Lord says here is that I'm going to visit the iniquity, the sins, the punishment of this generation or that generation to other generations to the third or fourth generation. What he is saying here is, and I think we, we, we miss this, what we lock in on is that God is going to punish, God is going to punish, God is going to punish to the third and fourth generation. What we miss is this, is the punishment is only inflicted if each successive generation does what the previous generation did. Many of you uh, knew my father, and many of you who knew him knew his testimony of how he was a drunk, how he was a womanizer, how he was just a bad boy. I saw, I was raised with much of that, seeing much of that. But the question is, am I going to be punished for what daddy did? 
No. I'm only going to be punished for what daddy did if I follow in daddy's footsteps. If I make the conscious decision to follow God and not follow daddy, then I'm not going to be punished. Why are you saying that, Stephen? Because there's this thing, there's this, this teaching that, is, that has been propound, that has been uh, announced and put forth for the last 20, 25 years. That's called generational curses. And generational blessings. It has its foundation in this statement and in other statements in the Old Testament about how God will visit the, the iniquity or the punishment from one generation to the other. But in every generation, every person in each generation has the ability not to break the punishment, but to decide whether they're going to follow in daddy's footsteps or they're going to follow God. And so what the Lord is saying here is, if you follow in daddy's footsteps, the same punishment that daddy got, you're going to get. You turn around, you repent, and you go the other direction, then I'm going to love you forever. <laughs> yes, sir. That's good. good word, bro. Israel had this idea, well, I'm not Israel, but even us today, our, our our thought pattern is, well, I can't help myself because it's what my mama did, it's what my daddy did, it's what my brothers and my sisters do. You can only not help yourself if you don't want to help yourself. If you want to help yourself, then you need to get hooked up with God. And he gives you the power not to do what they did. When people tell me I got to break that generational curse, I'm like, hmm. You can't do it by yourself. You've got to make a decision to follow God. That's what does it. Part of this from generation to generation is also this. Is that from, each gener from this generation, the first generation to the next generations, they all will learn how to dishonor God. And so I say to those of us who are in here who are parents and grandparents and aunties and uncles, you need to be careful about what you do, what you say, and how you act around these children. Amen. What are they learning from what you do? What are they learning from, about, uh, uh, from what you say? If I had an idol in my house, then my children naturally, because without Christ, there's a natural uh, 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 bent towards doing wrong. You ever notice you don't have to teach children how to do wrong? You, how many of y'all have taught a child how to lie? Tell his, his or her first lie. Didn't have to. It's in them. How many of you taught a child how to be selfish the first time? You didn't have to. It's in them. But what we can do, we can reinforce that wrong that's in them. In every individual, there is this void that only God can fill that, that, that says, I need to worship someone or something. And God says, I am that someone you should be worshiping and never worship a something. And so if I train my children by me having idols in my house, what do you think they're naturally going to go after? Those idols. And so God told Israel in Deuteronomy chapter 6, you need to talk to your children about me all the time, fathers. Tell them about me and who I am. God says, I'm going to visit the iniquity, the punishment on each successive generation to the third or fourth generation. What are some of those punishments? Perhaps weakness. Probably poverty. We have seen it uh, manifest itself in disease. And we have seen it also manifest itself in a short lifespan. Not everybody, not everybody who dies early is in violation of God's law. But many people who die early happen to be in violation of God's law. A couple of weeks ago, I had to preach a funeral for uh, Letitia uh, Winstead's brother, Robert Spencer. And Pastor Mac was there, and as I preached the funeral, I asked him to give the invitation. And Pastor Mac jumped up at the uh, opportunity to give the invitation, because I don't think there's anybody who can give an invitation better than Alan McFarland. I don't know anybody. 
he got up and he started talking about this post on Facebook. Um, I think it was one of Phil's cousins. And the guy said in, in the Facebook post, I believe in Jesus like I believe in the Easter Bunny. Max said he told Phil, don't, don't even respond to that. Don't even respond to that. A couple of weeks after that guy had that post, there was a tractor trailer on the highway carrying railroad ties. It came across from the direction in which it was going across the other side of the highway, didn't touch any vehicles, nobody got hurt. That young man was in his hotel room and that tractor trailer went right through his room. Carrying railroad ties. We can play with God if we want to. We can take God from his lofty position of being all powerful, all knowing, all loving, all wise. And we can reduce him down to the Easter Bunny. And he can take us right out. Sometimes the Lord shows favor. He gives grace. He gives mercy. He lets some people live longer to get a chance. But in this case, he didn't let that brother live any longer. Don't play with God, y'all. I can't, I can't make an image to represent my God. Whether I manufacture it with my hands or I manufacture it in my mind and my emotions. Can't do that. Can I give you a, uh, an example of how some people make images and they worship them, worshiping God? The blessings that God gives people. Some people worship those rather than worshiping God. You ever heard people just brag on the house and, and they want to attach God to it. The Lord bless me with this house. But you got to take off your shoes when you go in. You can't eat in this room. You can't put your hands on the walls. You see them out there on Saturday night just before dusk and dark with all the mosquitoes and they got scissors trimming this little bit of grass. They're spending more time taking care of serving. Don't carve them and don't serve them. But see what they did. But God gave it to me. But why are you spending more time with that thing than you are with God? That's an idol. I pray for the Lord to send me a husband. He sent me one. And that brother can't do no wrong. All those guys, we, we just wish our wives would say that, don't we? <laughs> the Bible says, submit yourselves to your husbands as unto the Lord. But when he's telling you to do things that are clear violations of the word and the law of God and you obey him over God, that husband is now your idol. Well, that wife is now your idol. Because what, what the Lord says, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself. So I'm going to give her everything she, no, 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 no. <laughs> let me read this let me read this verse to you to help kind of uh, draw home, uh, drive home this idea that God only punishes the person who has sinned and not successive generations before I get from this point look at Deuteronomy chapter 24 verse 16 in the same law that God gave to the nation of Israel, it says, I will visit the punishment from one generation to the third and fourth generation. Notice what he says also in that same law in Deuteronomy 24, 16. He says, fathers shall not be put to death for their children. 
nor children put to death for their fathers. For each is to die for his own sin. Own sin. I can't put on my father, Lord, the reason why I'm sick is because of what my daddy did. No, maybe I'm drinking. The Lord, why I have one of these STDs? No, my daddy won't whip that fifth, sixth, seventh woman that I was with. It won't him. It was me, my own sins. Can't blame it on anybody else, y'all. So what's the positive consequence of not having idols? Look at verse 6. Exodus 20, verse 6. The Lord says, but I'm going to be showing mercy, this loyal love, to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandment. Mer this, this word ha said is, is, is real complex in the Hebrew, but let's kind of reduce it down to loyal love that endures, that lasts, that, that stand fast. He says, I'll, for those who love me, I will love them for a long time. My love towards them will be enduring. Would you notice how the Lord says this, that the negative consequence is for the third or fourth generation, but his love is to thousands. What a great disparity. If you really want to enjoy God, love him, and it can be passed on to thousands and not just to the third and fourth generation. Because that's God's desire. His desire is for what? That we would love him as he has loved us. Jesus puts it in these terms when it comes to obeying the laws of God. He told, uh, well, uh, John wrote this. Jesus said, if a man loves me, he will keep my commandment. And in 1 John chapter 5, one of Jesus' disciples, he writes this. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments. And watch this. And his commandments are not burdensome or grievous. They're not hard, y'all. It goes against our grain, yes, but they're not hard. And when you think about the, the reward for doing what's right versus the reward for doing what's wrong, it's not that hard. How many times, parents, have you told your children, if you would just do what I tell you, life would go better for you? <laughs> haven't you said it? Yeah. Well, y'all haven't yet, because, you know. <laughs> but you probably will. It'll go easier for you if you just do what I tell you. Well, you need to tell that to yourself because God is saying life would be easier for you if you would just do what I tell you because my commandments are not burdensome. They are not grievous. They don't cause problems. You do it my way, you got my undying love, my fierce protection. I want to read a lengthy passage to you to close out with. This is Moses at the end of his life, um, knowing that he could not go into the promised land with the children of Israel. And so he gives them the law the second time. And he gives them this law because this is a generation who the previous generation had died out because they were unfaithful and unbelieving. So turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 4. I'm going to start reading at verse 15 and, and I just want to read what Moses says. I'm going to try not to give you any commentary here. But Deuteronomy chapter uh, 4 start at verse 15. Listen to this leader's admonition to the people even though he knows he's not going in the promised land with them. Take careful heed to yourselves for you saw no form when the Lord spoke to you at Horeb in the midst of the fire. This is why you shouldn't make Im uh, images because you didn't see anything. Lest you act corruptly and make yourselves a carved image in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female, the likeness of any animal that is on the earth, or the likeness of any winged bird that flies in the air, the likeness of anything that creeps on the ground, or the likeness of any fish that is in the water beneath the earth. Verse 19. And take heed, 
lest you lift your eyes to heaven and when you see the sun, the moon, the stars, and all the hosts of heaven, you feel driven to worship them and serve them, which the Lord your God has given to all the peoples under the whole heaven as a heritage. But as the Lord has taken you and brought you out of the iron furnace, out of Egypt, to be his people, even an inheritance as you are this day. Furthermore, the Lord was angry with me for your sakes and swore that I would not cross over the Jordan and that I would not enter the good land which the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance. But I must die in this land. I must not cross over the Jordan, but you shall cross over and possess that good land. Take heed to yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God which he made with you and make for yourselves a carved image in the form of anything which the Lord your God has forbidden you. Did you notice what, that Moses used the word covenant there? Remember when we started this whole series on the Ten Commandments? It's all about this covenant relationship that God has. And so, God, so Moses is reminding them at the end of his life, you still need to keep this covenant. Verse 24. For the Lord your God, here's the reason why you need to do this. For the Lord your God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. When you beget children and grandchildren have grown old in the land and act corruptly and make, carved, and make a carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger. Notice what Moses says here. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will soon utterly perish from the land which you cross over the Jordan to possess. You will not prolong your days in it, but will be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples, and you will be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And, you, and, and there you will serve God's the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. But from there you will seek the Lord your God, and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart, with all your soul. When you are in distress, and all these things come upon you in the latter days, when you turn to the Lord your God and obey his voice, for the Lord your God is a merciful God. He will not forsake you, nor destroy you, nor forget the covenant of your fathers which he swore to them. Moses says, take heed, several times he says in this passage, take heed, pay attention to, take note. He tells them what not to do. He warns them what will happen if they do what he tells them what not to do. He reminds them how God delivered them. So don't do it. And when you do it, it's amazing how the prophet and Moses came out. He said, because I know what's going to happen when you get over there. You're going to do this. And you're going to pay the price. And, and because you have given yourself over to carved images, you're going to be taken away to a land where you will worship nothing but carved images. But I want you to know something, he's saying to them. Still inside of you is going to be that desire for Yahweh. And if you turn away from worshiping those false idols and you turn to him, because God is a, he's a merciful God. Yeah, he's a consuming fire, but he's also a merciful God. If you turn away from the sin, then God will forgive you. Aren't you glad that we serve a forgiving yeah. God? How, I mean, we just mess up a whole lot. But if we call out to him, Lord, this is Stephen. I messed up. Lord, this is Kenny. I messed up. Lord, this is Cheryl. I messed up. Lord, I violated you. I violated your word. I've gone against what you said. Will you forgive me? And yes, he will. And you know what God did for Israel when he drove them to, the, to that foreign land? He brought them back home. He brought them back to the place that they could call home. He brought them back to that land that he promised them. But he could only bring them back once they changed their hearts and their minds to come back. Not to the land, but to him. The blessing was the land. That was the outpouring. But the repentance was because of who God was. We got to recognize who God is and not make any images. No 
idols. And next week, we want to talk about, if the Lord allows, we want to talk about the attraction of idols. What draws us away? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. Father, there are many times that we have manufactured, if not with our hands, certainly in our minds and our hearts, things that cannot adequately represent you. We ask, Lord, that you would forgive us for those times. Most of the time, Lord, we, re we recognize it is our own desires, our own philosophies, our own ideas that we put before you. I pray that you would instill in us ears to hear your voice. And we pray that you would speak to us, Lord, that when we are starting to go astray, Speak, Lord, and help us to be like Samuel and say, speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Lord, would you search our hearts? And there may be some things that we don't even realize that we have put before you. We may not realize certain things that we have manufactured, we have produced falsely. Reveal it to us that we might repent of it and worship you in spirit and in truth. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>